Hello and welcome to Pendant Ring, Part 14, Carmilla. Chapter 15, Ordeal and Execution. As he spoke, one of the strangest looking men I ever beheld entered the chapel at the door through which Carmilla had made her entrance and her exit. He was tall, narrow-chested, stooping, with high shoulders and dressed in black. His face was brown and dried in with deep furrows. He wore an oddly shaped hat with a broad leaf. His hair, long and grizzled, hung on his shoulders. He wore a pair of gold spectacles and walked slowly with an odd shambling gait, with his face sometimes turned up to the sky and sometimes bowed down toward the ground, seemed to wear a perpetual smile. His long, thin arms were swinging, and his lank hands, in old black gloves ever so much too wide for them, waving and gesticulating in utter abstraction. "'The very man!' exclaimed the general, advancing with manifest delight. "'My dear Baron, how happy I am to see you! I had no hope of meeting you so soon!' He signed to my father, who had by this time returned, and leading the fantastic old gentleman whom he called the Baron to meet him. He introduced him formally, and they at once entered into earnest conversation. The stranger took a roll of paper from his pocket and spread it onto the worn surface of a tomb that stood by. He had a pencil case in his fingers, with which he traced imaginary lines from point to point on the paper, which, from their often glancing from it together at certain points of the building, I concluded to be a plan of the chapel. He accompanied what I may term his lecture with occasional readings from a dirty little book whose yellow leaves were closely written over. They sauntered together down the side aisle, opposite to the spot where I was standing, conversing as they went, and they began measuring distances by paces, and finally they all stood together facing a piece of the side wall, which they began to examine with great minuteness, pulling off the ivy that clung over it and wrapping the plaster with the ends of their sticks, scraping here and knocking there. At length, they ascertained the existence of a broad marble tablet with letters carved in relief upon it. With the assistance of the woodman, who soon returned, a monumental inscription and carved escutcheon were disclosed. They proved to be those of the long-lost monument of Mircalla, Countess Karnstein, raised his hands and eyes to heaven in mute thanksgiving for some moments. Tomorrow, I heard him say, the commissioner will be here and the inquisition will be held according to law. Then turning to the old man with the gold spectacles whom I have described, he shook him warmly by both hands and said, Baron, how can I thank you? How can we all thank you? You will have delivered this region from a plague that has scourged its inhabitants for more than a century. The horrible enemy, thank God, is at last tracked. My father led the stranger aside, and the general followed. I know that he had led them out of hearing, that he might relate my case, and I saw them glance often quickly at me as the discussion proceeded. My father came to me, kissed me again and again, and leading me from the chapel said, It is time to return, but before we go home, we must add to our party the good priest who lives but a little way from this, and persuade him to accompany us to the Schloss. In this quest we were successful, and I was glad, being unspeakably fatigued when we reached home. But my satisfaction was changed to dismay on discovering that there were no tidings of Carmilla. Of the scene that had occurred in the ruined chapel, no explanation was offered to me, and it was clear that it was a secret which my father for the present determined to keep from me. The sinister absence of Carmilla made the remembrance of the scene more horrible to me. The arrangements for the night were singular. Two servants and Madame were to sit up in my room that night, and the ecclesiastic, with my father, kept watch in the adjoining dressing room. The priest had performed certain solemn rites that night, the purport of which I did not understand any more than I comprehended the reason of this extraordinary precaution taken for my safety during sleep. I saw all clearly a few days later. The disappearance of Carmilla was followed by the discontinuance of my nightly sufferings. You have heard no doubt of the appalling superstition that prevails in Upper and Lower Styria, in Moravia, Silesia, in Turkish Serbia, in Poland, even in Russia, the superstition, so we must call it, of the vampire. If human testimony, taken with every care and solemnity judicially before commissions innumerable, 
each consisting of many members, all chosen for integrity and intelligence, and constituting reports more voluminous perhaps than exist upon any one other class of cases, is worth anything. It is difficult to deny or even to doubt the existence of such a phenomenon as the vampire. For my part, I have heard no theory by which to explain what I myself have witnessed and experienced, other than that supplied by the ancient and well-attested belief of this country. The next day, the formal proceedings took place in the chapel of Karnstein. The grave of the Countess Marsala was opened, and the general and my father recognized each his perfidious and beautiful guest in the face now disclosed to view. The features, though a hundred and fifty years had passed since her funeral, were tinted with the warmth of life. Her eyes were open, no cadaverous smell exhaled from the coffin. The two medical men, one officially present, the other on the part of the promoter of the inquiry, attested the marvelous fact that there was a faint but appreciable respiration and the corresponding action of the heart. The limbs were perfectly flexible, the flesh elastic, and the leaden coffin floated with blood, in which, to a depth of seven inches, the body lay immersed. Here, then, were all the admitted signs and proofs of vampirism. The body, therefore, in accordance with the ancient practice, was raised, and a sharp stake driven through the heart of the vampire, who uttered a piercing shriek at the moment in all respects such as might escape from a living person in the last agony. Then the head was struck off, and a torrent of blood flowed from the severed neck, the body and head was next placed on a pile of wood and reduced to ashes, which were thrown upon the river and borne away, and that territory has never since been plagued by the visits of a vampire. My father has a copy of the report of the Imperial Commission, with the signatures of all who were present at these proceedings attached in verification of the statement. It is from this official paper that I have summarized my account of this last shocking scene. Thank you for joining us today. Subscribe for more books and short videos about histories of specific years. See you next time on Pendant and Ring.